introduction, the internal and external environments of a business refers to the factors that influence the operations. So, internal environment includes elements within the company like its resources, employees, culture, and internal processes. And these are the things the business can control and optimize to perform better. While external environment consists of factors outside the company that it cannot directly control. This includes market threat, competition, economic conditions, regulations, and technology. So, the external environment plays a very important role in shaping how businesses need to plan and act. Here's why. The external environment presents both opportunities, like, for example, new market trends, emerging technologies, and threats, like economic uh, boundaries, new competitors. So, a business needs to identify this and adjust its strategy accordingly. Also, companies that continuously monitor changes in their external environment can better adapt to stay competitive. So, the impact on strategy formulation. So, when formulating strategies, companies analyze external factors like consumer needs, regulatory changes, or industry shifts. So, for example, if a new law impacts certain materials used, a company might need to rethink its production methods. So, in short, while companies have control over their internal workings, their success is large, largely influenced by the external environment. And strategically managing these external factors helps businesses grow and maintain a competitive edge. Porter's Five Forces model, introduced by Michael Porter in 1979 until 1980. According to Porter, this helps business understand the competitive forces within their industry that affect their ability to drive. It's a tool for analyzing the competitive environment and shaping strategy. So first is the competitive rivalry or the competition among ex existing firms. So in hospitality and tourism, this refers to how intense competition is between hotels, restaurants, airlines, or travel agencies. So the more competition, the harder it is to stand out. For example, if many hotels are competing for the same customers, they might lower prices or offer unique services like free breakfast or room upgrades to attract their guests. Second is threat of new entrants. So this course look at how easy it is for new business to enter the industry. So in tourism, new hotels, restaurants, or tour operators, it can pop up quickly, especially if the industry is booming. So when the, uh, so when a new business enters the market, it increases competition and could force existing players to lower price or entity. Third is bargaining power of suppliers. So this refers to the power of suppliers like food vendors for restaurants or living suppliers for hotels. So if there are only a few suppliers, they can charge higher price or dictate terms, which impacts the perf profitability of business and the hospitality industry. So on the other hand, if there are many suppliers, businesses can shop around for better deals. But the fourth one is bargaining power of buyers or customers. So customers in the hospitality and tourism industry can have lots of influence, especially with the rise of online reviews and platforms like um, Facebook or Instagram. And they can easily compare prices and services, which pushes business to provide better value and experiences. So the more choices customers have, the more power they hold to demand better deals, discounts, or services. And lastly, threats of substitutes. So this course looks at the availability of alternative products or services that can replace what the business offers. So in tourism, substitutes can be things like virtual tours instead of traveling, home cooking instead of dining out, or staying with friends instead of booking a hotel. So if substitutes are appealing or cost-effective, business in hospitality may lose customers unless they anyway can offer something unique or valuable. So understanding this fire on um, forces helps businesses, not just in hospitality and tourism industry, make better decisions about pricing, customer service, supply relations, and innovation. For instance, knowing the threats of new um, entrants might push a hotel to improve its loyalty program. While well, understanding the bargaining power of customers could inspire a restaurant to offer more personalized dining experience. So overall, Porter's Five Forces models help companies and the sector identify the challenges and opportunities in their environment, ensuring that they, um, that they stay competitive and relevant in a crowded marketplace. Characterizing the external environment. So the external environment of a business refers to everything outside the company that can impact its success. And this includes people, other businesses, systems, and institutions that the company doesn't control but must respond to. So what is external environment? So, external environments are everything happening outside a company's walls, such as economic conditions, comp competitors, government policies, social trends, and te technological advances. So, these factors um, influence how a business operates, often in ways the company can directly control but needs to adapt to. So, 
Examples of sustainable sources uh, is uh, individuals or customers, influencers, and other people who affect what a business um, sells and how it sells. Also, firms like competitors or partners that can change market dynamics. While in systems, it was like um, broader system like legal frameworks or economic systems that dictate how business can function. And lastly, intuition. So, government bodies, regulatory agencies, or industry associations that set rules and standards. So, why does the external environment matter? So, the external environment creates opportunities and challenges for business. For example, if a, new if a new competitor enters the market with a more advanced product, a business might have to elevate or lower its price. If the government introduces new regulations, the company might need to adjust its process to stay compliant. So, in short, a business must keep an eye on the external environment because it uh, constantly shifts and creates new conditions that affect how they complete, grow, or, and survive. The internal environment, on the other hand, as defined by Dupont in 1972, refers to everything inside a company that influences how decisions are made. It includes both social factors like company culture, employee relationships, and leadership systems, and also physical factors like equipment, technology, and workspace. So what does the internal environment include? So social factors is first, and this could be things like how employees work together, the company's values, communication styles, and leadership dynamics. So for example, if employees feel um, supported, supported and valued, they're more likely to make decisions that benefit the company. Physical factors, on the other hand, are the tangible resources like technology a company uses. So the layout of the office or the equipment available. This physical tools influence how efficiently people work and the decision they make. So why is the internal environment important? So it is important because it shapes the day-to-day -day decision of employees and leaders. A positive internal environment can lead to better decision making, higher productivity, and more innovation. On the other hand, if the internal environment is poor, like if the company has a data technology or a toxic culture, it can negatively affect decision making and overall performance. So overall, the internal environment is like the atmosphere inside the company and directly affects how people within the organization think, act, and make decisions. The third one is scanning the environment. So this means looking at both the internal and external factors that affects a business. So this helps the company understand its current situations and plan for the future. One common method for doing this is called a SWOT analysis. So what is SWOT analysis? So it is the tool that helps business look at four key areas. Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So in strength, what the company does well, such as having a strong brand, loyal customers, or unique products. On weaknesses, on the other hand, it is the area where the company struggles, like outdated technology, high, high cost, or weak customer service. Opportunities is the external factors the company can take advantage of, such as new market trends, untapped customer bases, or emerging technologies. While on threats, external challenges that could harm the business like new competitors, changing regulations, or economic boundaries. So why is it SWOT analysis important? So by conducting a SWOT analysis, companies can better understand where they stand. It helps business build on their strength, address their weaknesses, seize opportunities for growth, and also prepare for a counter any threats. So SWOT analysis helps a company figure out what it's good at, where it needs to improve, and how to navigate opportunities and risks in its environment. It's like taking a snapshot of where the business stands to make smarter decisions for the future. Strategic fit and strategic intent. So Albert Humphrey is a key figure behind the development of SWOT analysis, introduced the concept of strategic fit, which refers to the alignment between a company's internal strength, life sources, and capabilities, and the external opportunities in the market. So what is a strategic fit? So this means making sure that what a company is good at, like its internal resources and skills, matches up with opportunities in the marketplace. So when a company's strengths align well with what the market needs or offers, it is better positioned to succeed. For example, uh, in hotels with not much customer service and a strong online booking system, if there is a growing demand for eco-friendly travel, the hotel can use its existing strengths to offer sustainable options like green certifications or eco-friendly amenities and tap it into the opportunity. So why strategic fit important? So it is important because it allows companies to use their strengths to make or to take advantage of new opportunities. Also to avoid wasting resources on things that stay on things that don't align with their core abilities. Also, it is to stay competitive by being responsive to external changes like new trends or shifts in customers' preferences. So a strategic fit is about making sure that companies' talents and resources are used in the right way to meet market demand and growth. Hamel and 
Prahalad in their work from 1989 and 1994 emphasized the business should focus on strategic positioning to maintain a long-term competitive edge. In other words, companies shouldn't just think about short-term wins but need to have a clear long-term strategy that keeps them ahead of competitors. So what is strategic positioning? So it is about where a company wants to stand in the market in the long run. So it's not just about reacting to what's happening now, but thinking ahead and positioning its business in a way that it stays competitive over time. So why is it important? So according to Hamel and Prahalad, that companies need to have bigger vision and they should focus on core, competi core competencies or meaning what they do best and what makes them unique. Second is the innovation or continuously improving and adapting to stay relevant as the market changes. And lastly, the long-term goals. So looking beyond uh, immediate profits to build a sustainable competitive advantage that lasts. One of the best examples of this are the Apple company because they doesn't just create one successful product and stop. They continuously innovate and position themselves as a leader in technology, ensuring they stay competitive not just today, but in the future. So in a simple term, Hamel and Prahalad were saying that business needs to think strategically about their position in the market, focusing on long-term success rather, th rather than just a short-term gain. So this mindset helps them sustain a competitive advantage and thrive over time. Strategic resources and capabilities refers to the important assets, the skills, and strength like a company uses to compete in the market. So having these resources and abilities is essential or important, but timing plays a huge role in determining their success. So why is it important? Because it's not enough for a business to just have the right tools or know-how. It also needs to act at the right moment. So if a company doesn't take advantage of an opportunity when it arises, even the best resources might go to waste. For example, in tech company that has the ability to create a groundbreaking product. So if they wait too long to launch it, competitors might get there first. So on the other side, if they launch too early without being fully prepared, they risk failure. And the key is to act when the market is ready, but before competitors do. So what does this mean for business? So companies need to not only build strong resources and skills, but also have the keen sense of marketing timing. This means being ready to seize opportunities as soon as they appear, stay agile and responsive to changes in the market, and also to use their strengths when it matters the most. So having the right resources is important, but knowing when to use them is just as critical. Being prepared and acting at the right moment can give a business a competitive edge. Which came out first, the iPod or iTunes? One way of thinking is that you need to have the hardware first, then develop the software to load onto it. But iTunes was released on January 9, 2001, and the iPod Classic was released 10 months later in October that year. Apple had bought iTunes from a developer in 1999 and brought three employees over to Apple headquarters. Is this an example of Apple finding a strategic fit or stretch? Before we answer this, let's have a think about what the two words fit and stretch are likely to mean using another example. Your company owns agricultural land and grows fresh root vegetables like potatoes, parsnips and carrots. In a strategic move to improve revenue, you import two Mexican garlic species and ginger root from Thailand and begin growing them. Their yields are much lower, but sale prices are up to 700% more than your current products. The company is working to get more from its target market and is utilising existing resources to do it. This is a strategic fit. The marketing director of the company presents research to you of a new export market in dehydrated ground spices to Asia. These products will have a shelf life of two years, but will require $1.2 million of capital equipment and export logistics. You currently only grow fresh vegetables. For this new product category, you will only supply garlic and ginger and buy all the other spices in to then process and package them on your new manufacturing line. The company is positioning itself to enter a new market. Some of its competencies will be utilised, but it will also need to develop new ones. This is a strategic stretch initiative. Now let's go back to Apple. iTunes is a software package. It represents a whole new platform for the way consumers could listen to music. Apple's core competencies were building innovative computers with a flair for design and usability. Now they were building a database of music, which was vastly different. Hence they brought new capabilities into the team. This was an example of strategic stretch and clever competitive positioning. If Apple released the iPod, it would have a unique product that accessed content the same way MP3 and MP4 devices would. 
very soon competitors would also build their iPods. But Apple strategically moved to become the content owners, and of course only iTunes linked to Apple devices initially. Apple fundamentally changed the rules of the game. It took on a significant risk with the knowledge that if iTunes could become the dominant source of music content, then it had a strong competitive advantage over its rivals. Let's recap. Strategic fit is about utilising the company's resources to perform activities that improve profitability in their current markets. This could include acquiring a competitor to defend market share, releasing a product line extension, moving production to a lower cost country, and divesting the distribution business to manage risk. Strategic stretch is about leveraging your resources or creating new competencies to improve your value proposition to the consumer. It's likely to involve innovation. You might create complementary products to find a new consumer market. Reorganise your resources to deliver your products to a new geographic market. The reality is, of course, that companies don't perform either strategic fit or stretch. It's a combination approach. Strategic stretch will nearly always require more investment to deliver with more risk attached, but the rewards can also be much larger. Strategic intent is a concept introduced by Hamlet and Kravalev in 1989. And it is about a company's long-term vision and determination to achieve bigger goals, even if it doesn't currently have all the resources or capabilities to do so. So what is a strategic intent? So it means that a company is focused on a specific ambitious goal and is committed to achieving it no matter what. It's like aiming high and working steadily towards that target over time. And the idea is that to build a sustainable competitive advantage. So a business needs more than just strong resources or skills. It needs to have a clear purpose and use them or use this strength to, to tap into the right opportunities. Why is it important? According to Hamlet and Thrahamad, businesses can't just rely on their current resources or capabilities to stay ahead. They need to think bigger. Strategic intent helps companies to stay focused on long-term success, push beyond their current limits by continuously improving and innovating, and lastly, to use their resources wisely to capture new opportunities in the market. In Porter's idea from 1980 highlights that a company competitive advantage comes from using its resources and capabilities be better than its rivals. So when a business is ahead of its competition, it means they are maximizing their strength, like their technology, expertise, or customer service more effectively than others in the market. So what does this mean? Competitive advantage means being better than your competitors in a way that your customers notice it. It could be offering better products, lower prices, or superior service. To maintain this advantage, companies need to use their existing resources and capabilities to their full potential, making sure that they're getting the most out of what they already have. So what Porter is saying is that businesses that fully maximize their strength will be able to maintain an advantage over their competitors for a long time. And the key is to keep pushing those resources and capabilities to their limit to stay in front. Environmental characteristics. So first is the environmental uncertainty. So this one refers to the challenge of predicting what will happen in the future. It's about how hard it is to foresee events or changes that could affect a business. For example, if a company can predict changes in customer's preferences or economic shifts, it can face uncertainty. Second is the environmental volatility. So this refers to how quickly things change in the external environment. It's about the speed and frequency of changes that can impact a business. So for example, if a tech industry sees rapid advancements and new trends popping up all the time, that's a high volatility. So the third one is the environmental manifestations. So this refers to how much opportunity there is for a business to grow and thrive. So it's about the abundance of resources and favorable conditions available in the market. For example, if a market has lots of customers and resources are plentiful or many, it's considered manifestant. So fourth is the illiberality. So it is the opposite of manifestants. So it describes an environment where opportunities for growth are limited and resources are low. For example, if a market is small with few customers and resources are hard to come by, it's an illiberal environment. Next is the environmental hostility. So this one refers to the tough, unfavorable conditions in a business environment that makes it hard to succeed. It's about the challenges and obstacles that negatively affect the company. For example, if a business is facing harsh economic conditions, strict regulations, or intense competition, these are signs of environmental hostility. So next is the market hostility. So it refers to tough, unfavorable conditions, specifically within a company industry or market. It's about the challenges and obstacles that directly affects a business's abilities to operate and succeed. For example, if a company is dealing with a fierce competition, 
declining demand, or high cost in its market, that's a market hostility. And lastly, the environmental turbulence. So this one describes how much and how quickly things change in a company's external environment, as well as how company different factors are at play. Like for example, if a business faces frequent changes and many different challenges from various sources, like shifting market trends, new regulations, and economic fluctuations, that's a high environmental turbulence. Environmental characteristics. So first is the environmental uncertainty. So this one refers to the challenge of predicting what will happen in the future. It's about how hard it is to foresee events or changes that could affect a business. For example, if a company can predict changes in customers' preferences or economic shifts, it can face uncertainty. Second is the environmental volatility. So this refers to how quickly things change in the external environment. It's about the speed and frequency of changes that can impact a business. So for example, if a tech industry sees rapid advancements and new trends popping up all the time, that's a high volatility. So the third one is the environmental manifestations. So this refers to how much opportunity there is for a business to grow and thrive. So it's about the abundance of resources and favorable conditions available in the market. For example, if a market has lots of customers and resources are plentiful or many, it's considered inefficient. So third is the illiberality. So it is the opposite of manifestations. So it describes an environment where opportunities for growth are limited and resources are low. For example, if a market is small with few customers and resources are hard to comply, it's an illiberal environment. Next is the environmental hostility. So this one refers to the tough, unfavorable conditions in a business environment that makes it hard to succeed. It's about the challenges and obstacles that negatively affect the company. For example, if a business is facing harsh economic conditions, strict regulations, or intense competition, these are signs of environmental hostility. So next is the market hostility. So it refers to tough, unfavorable conditions specifically within a company industry or market. It's about the challenges and obstacles that directly affect a business's abilities to operate and succeed. For example, if a company is dealing with a fierce competition, declining demand, or high cost in its market, that's a market hostility. And lastly, the environmental turbulence. So this one describes how much and how quickly things change in a company's external environment, as well as how company different factors are at play. Like for example, if a business faces frequent changes and many different challenges from various sources, like shifting market trends, new regulations, and economic fluctuations, that's a high environmental turbulence. Environment dimension. So the simple context dimension of an environment is about how many different factors or variables are affecting a business. First is the simple environment. If there are just a few factors influencing the business, the environment is considered simple. For example, if a company only needs to consider a few key competitors and a stable set of regulations, it's a simpler environment. It's like playing a game with only a few rules, easier to manage and predict. On the other hand, complex environment has many factors at play, like numerous competitors, constantly changing regulations, and various market trends, making it, the, making it a complex environment. Like for example, a company operating in a rapidly evolving tech market with many players and variables faces a more complex environment. It's like, a play, it's like playing a game with lots of rules and moving parts, meaning more challenging to navigate and platform. So the more factors you have to deal with, the more complex the environment becomes, making it harder to manage and predict. Now let's talk about environment types. The environment is divided into general, task, and firm categories. The general environment has a broad impact on the firm, while the task environment is more immediate specific to the industry structure and influenced by incumbent firm strategies. It includes the industry environment categorized based on existing company's strategies. The environment is classified into various strategies, so it could be comprehended analyzed in terms of the forces that emanate from it and used as part of the firm's decision-making framework. The literature identifies the categories of the environment to consist of the general, the fast, and the firm environments, whereas the general environment is macro on, in terms of its effects on the firm, the task environment is more immediate, and the business environment with RMS based on the industry structure, and it is derived from the incumbent firm's positioning strategies consists of categorizing FIN, which the firm operates. The industry environment, which is an integral part of the test environment, consists of categorizing firms based on the industry structure, and it is derived from the incumbent firm's positioning strategies. 
So wet is general environment. It refers to the broader, overarching environment that influences the industry and economy as a whole, rather than just a specific organization. That is the components includes broader societal forces like demographic exchanges, cultural trends, economic conditions, technological adv advancement, and international events. What is the impact? It influences long-term strategies and shapes the overall industry landscapes. What is task environment? It is part of the external environment that directly affects the organization, operations, and performance. What is the components? It includes competitors, customers, suppliers, and labor supply. And what is the impact? These elements have an immediate impact on an organization's daily activities and strategic decisions. Understanding the macro environment. The company operates within a micro environment that directly affects it, while the macro environment influences it on a broader social and cultural level. This includes economic, technological, political, and ecological factors. Boundaries between these environments are conceptual for clarity. Understanding the microenvironment means keeping an eye on the bigger picture that affects a business. This includes things like the state of the economy, political changes, social trends, new technologies, environmental issues, and global events. By paying attention to these broader influences, Businesses can better navigate challenges and seize new opportunities. For example, noticing a shift in consumer preferences or a new tech breakthrough can help a company stay ahead. It's all about staying informed and adaptable in a constantly changing world so businesses can make smart decisions and thrive despite the ups and downs. Political or Legal Environment in strategic management refers to the influence of government policies, regulations, and legal framework on, on an organization, operations, and strategy. This includes laws, trade, res, trade restrictions, taxation, labor, regal, re, labor regulations, and political stability which can impact business decision, risk management, and long-term planning. The political legal environment covers how government rules and po political stability affect businesses. It includes everything from taxes and labor laws to trade agreements and, and environmental regulations. For example, if new environmental laws are introduced, companies might need to change their practices, which could mean extra costs. On the flip side, a new trade deal might help business expand to a new market. Political stability is also crucial. If the government is unstable, it can create uncertainty and risk. Businesses need to stay informed about these changes to adapt and keep running so smoothly in a shifting landscape. Now let's talk about general environment key variables or issues to track and analyze. General environment, political or legal, variable issues to track and analyze regional policies, change in government, terrorism, wars, new regulations impacting businesses including minimum wage, manufacturing and consumption of indigenous products and so on, policies related to protectionism, international trade related policies, health related policies, labor law and hiring workforce locally versus from abroad, policies related to the ecology including global warming, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on, policies related to corporate and personal taxation. Now let's talk about economic, interest rates, infl inflation rate, GDP growth rate, cost of input factors, consumer price index, consumer confidence, price oil and commodities, stock market, mortgage rates, balance of trade or exports and imports, exchange rates and purchasing power parity, corporate personal and capital gain taxes, availability of credit, and unemployment rate. Sociocultural, demographic changes under of it is birth and death rates, immigration, immigration age-related changes, gender-related changes, and education-related development. 
Next, next is psychographic changes. Under of it is lifestyle of the baby boomer generation and lifestyles of generation of X and Y. Next is cultural changes and under of it is multiculturalism and last is other factors and under of it is spread of disease, work-life balance, terrorism or religion and nationalism. Next is technological. New technology related hardware, new technology related software, new technology applications, development of new products, investments in technology related R&D, and safety and security related technological developments. Last is ecological. Under the track and analyze is demand for green products, supply of green products, global warming and greenhouse gas emissions, disposal of waste, recycling paper and landfills, deforestation and climatic changes, and protecting the natural environment or flora and fauna. So what is economic environment? The economic environment in strategic management refers to the external economic factors that influence an organization operations and decision making. These factors include economic growth, inflation rates, interest rates, unemployment level, exchange rates, and overall economic stability. Understanding the economic environment helps organizations anticipate market conditions, plan for potential risks, and identify opportun opportunities for growth. The economic environment is all about how the overall state of economic affects businesses. For example, when the economy is booming and people have jobs, they tend to spend more, which can be great for businesses, businesses sales. But if, in, but if inflation is high, it can switch both consumers and companies, leading to higher costs and tighter budget. By, by keeping an eye of these economic trends, businesses can adjust their plans and strategies to stay on track and make smart decisions in both good times and low ones. Now let's talk about social cultural environment. Social cultural factors encompasses the underlying attitudes, behavior, and values that permit a society. These factors constantly evolve alongside trends in population, lifestyle, culture, and traditions. They represent the shared custom and practices that society shapes and often pass down through generations. Like other business environment, the social cultural environment is dynamic and constantly evolving across groups. This, um, this shift would present both opportunities and threats for businesses. So to navigate this changing landscape, companies must actively monitor these trends and consider their strategic implications. The social cultural environment is not static. Population constantly grow and change due to factors like birth rates, that rates and immigration patterns. This demographic shift, along with evolving social values and customs, present both opportunities and threats for businesses. Companies that can effectively monitor and analyze social cultural trends can develop informed strategies to capitalize on new market opportunities and mitigate potential risk. It is closely linked to social cultural factors as the concept of demographics because demographics refer to the composition of a population, including characteristics, uh, including characteristics such as gender, age, ethnicity, race, language, education level, occupation, income, family size, and religion. By understanding both demographics and social cultural environment, which are often used interchangeable as social demographic factors, businesses gain valuable insights into customer behavior. Next is the factors of social cultural environment. So there's seven factors of social cultural environment. First is the culture, language, religion, social systems, education level, demographics, and social values. So culture, culture encompasses the shared belief, traditions, and values of a society. It molds consumers' preferences and business practices. For instance, cultural differences impact product design, 
marketing messages, and customer introduction, requiring businesses to adopt strategies accordingly. Text as the language, language shapes communication and understanding, and global business language barriers can hinder effective communication, affecting negotiations and customer relations. So companies must tailor their communication to resonate with local audience, ensuring clarity and connection. Religion. Religious belief influence consumer behaviors and societal norms. Businesses must consider religious holidays, dietary restriction, and cultural practices when offering products and services. So adapting to, do, to these factors can lead to increased acceptance and market share. And social system. Social system define relationship, rules, and interactions within a community. Businesses need to understand family dynamics, gender roles, and community structures to tailor their offerings. Adapting to social norms enhances customer satisfaction and fosters stronger connections. At the education level, education influences consumer awareness, preferences, and expectation. More educated societies may demand innovative products and value-added services. So businesses need to align their offerings with the educational background of their target audience to meet evolving demands. Demographics, characteristics like age, gender, income, and occupation impact consumer behavior and market segments. For example, an aging population may require healthcare and elderly friendly products. Businesses must analyze demographics to target the right audience and develop relevant solutions. And last is social values. Evolving social values drive changes in consumer preferences and demands. Concepts like sustainability, diversity, and social responsibility influence purchasing decisions. So adapting to these values can enhance a company reputation and attract socially conscious consumers. Now the impact of social cultural environment on businesses. First is the market relevance. Adopting products and services to match cultural preferences ensures higher consumer acceptance and market relevance. Next is brand loyalty. Respecting local values and customs fosters brand loyalty and long-term customers' relationships. Next, innovation. Embracing diverse perspective encourages innovation and the development of new solutions that meet societal needs. Next, public perception. Addressing social values positively impacts a company's reputation, attracting socially conscious consumers. Next, business sustainability. Understanding demographic shift enables businesses to anticipate changing demands and remain sustainable over time. Next is the global expansion. A deep understanding of social cultural is vital for successful international expansion and business operations. And last, competitive advantage. Companies that effectively navigate the social cultural landscape gain a competitive edge by better addressing customer needs. Technological environment. Technology had played a major role in the way products and services are consumed, how they are produced, and even how they are marketed and distributed. Significant changes have taken place in post-World War II era in terms of the role of technology in science, engineering, and business. So, technological environment means the development in the field of technology which affect business by new inventions of, prod of productions and other improvements and techniques to perform their business work. It is also consists of external factors in technology that impact business operations, like changes in technology affect how a company will do business. Examples of technological changes are seen in aviation, electronics, energy, communication, consumer goods industry, optics, medicine, and manufacturing. 
let's look at the six key factors of the technological environment which affect the operations of organizations. First, innovation and advancement, automation and efficiency, digital transformation, data management and analytics, e-commerce and online presence, and last is the cybersecurity and privacy. First, let's talk about innovation and advancement. Technological innovation like new inventions and discoveries can revolutionize how a business operates. They bring opportunities for improved products, services, and processes. For example, the introduction of smartphones led to a new ways of communication and change how companies interact with customers. Next, automation and efficiency. Automation involves using machines and software to perform tasks previously done by humans. It boosts efficiency, reduces errors, and saves time. For instance, factories now use robots for assembly, leading to faster and more precise production. Next, digital transformation. Businesses are adopting digital tools and platforms to streamline operations and engage with customers. Digitalization enables online sales, data analysis, and personalized marketing. Companies that embrace this trend often have a better customer experiences and reach a wider audience. Data management and analytics. The ability to gather, analyze, and utilize data is crucial. It helps in making informed decisions predicting trends, and understanding customer preferences. For instance, e-commerce platforms track user behavior to recommend products, enhancing sales. Next, e-commerce and online presence. The rise of e-commerce has transformed the way businesses sell products. Having an online presence through websites and social media is essential for reaching a global audience. So this impacts sales, brand visibility, and customer engagement. Last is the cybersecurity and privacy. As technology advances, so do cyber threats. Protecting sensitive data and ensuring customer privacy is paramount. So companies invest in cybersecurity measures to prevent breaches that could damage their reputation and result in financial losses. Ecological environment. The ecological environment in business refers to the relationship between business practices and the natural environment. It encompasses how businesses impact ecosystem, biodiversity, and natural resources, and how they address environmental sustainability. So integrating ecological considerations into business operations is increasingly crucial for companies, not only to comply with regulations, but also to meet consumer expectations, enhance their brand reputation, and contribute to long-term sustainability. Ecological environment, it is a branch of science that examines living things interest with the environment separately and in foot, instead of examining them at the same time. Ecology, which examines the positive and negative effect of living things on the environment they live in, aims to minimize environmental problems and sustain the sustainability of life. So the ecological environment in business refers to the interplay between a company's operations and the natural world. It focuses on how businesses impact the environment and how environmental factors in return affect business activities. Factors of ecological environment. First is the natural resources, availability of raw materials, and renewable versus non-renewable. Second is climate and weather patterns, climate change, and natural disaster. Next is the biodiversity, ecosystem health, and conservation health. Next is the pollution and waste management, air and water pollution, and waste disposal. And last is the regulatory environment, environmental regulations, and international agreements. 
technological advances like green technology and environmental monitoring. And last, consumer behavior and social trends. Eco-conscious consumers and corporate social responsibility or CSR. Next is the economic factors, cost of compliance, and market opportunities. Globalization, supply chain impact, and international standards. And last is the stakeholder pressure, investors, non-government organization, or NGOs. In the previous slides, we discussed the macro environment consisting of the environment types and how these environment types impact the hospitality and tourism industry. On these slides, we'll give us an understanding of how firms or organizations are influenced by the task environment. The task environment and influence of industry structure. The task environment refers to the immediate external factors and conditions that directly affect a business operations and decision-making process. Unlike the broader general environment, which includes more distant and indirect factors like economic trends or cultural shift, the task environment consists of elements that have a direct impact on the company's ability to achieve its objectives. Understanding and effectively managing the task environment is crucial for organizations to adapt to changing market conditions and stay competitive in their industry. And within the task environment, organizations must continuously monitor and analyze various aspects to make informed decisions. The task environment consists of customers, competitors, suppliers, and regulators. These four components of the task environment influence the firms in the industries. Customer, the needs, preferences, and behaviors of customers directly impact the organization's product or services. Competitors, rival companies and their strategies influence the organization's competitive position. Suppliers, the availability, reliability, and cost of input materials or resources can affect the organization operations. And last is the regulators. Laws, regulations, and policies set by government bodies can significantly affect the organization operation and compliance requirements. By closely monitoring and analyzing these factors, Managers can gain insights into the external forces that shape their organization operations, opportunities, and challenges. The task environment directly affects the organization in several ways. First, strategic planning. The task environment helps organizations identify opportunities and threats, allowing them to develop effective strategic planning. Second, decision making. Managers use information about the task environment to make informed decisions regarding product development, market expansion, and resource allocation. Third, competitive advantage. Understanding the task environment allows organizations to identify and exploit competitive advantage over their rivals. And last is the adaptability. By monitoring the task environment, Organizations can adopt their strategies and operations to change in customer preferences, market conditions, or regulatory requirements. In summary, the task environment plays a critical role in shaping an organization's strategies, decision-making process, and overall performance. Porter's Five Forces model is essential for businesses and organizations because it provides a comprehensive framework to analyze the competitive forces that shapes an industry. This model also allows businesses to gain a deep understanding of the market dynamics that influence profitability, sustainability, and strategic direction. So it consists of potential competitors, competitiveness among industry incumbents, buyers' influence, suppliers' influence, and substitute product. 
potential competitors. It is a new competitor firms to enter and establish themselves in a relatively short period of time. It's said to have a low barriers to entry with a high exposure to risk of potential competitors. It is a firm in competitive market that face the risk of eroding profitability, particularly from new entrants. It has also established companies often defend their market position by lowering prices and reducing margins, making it difficult for newcomers to sustain profitability. However, if this strategy fails to deter entry, it signals increased risk for all firms in the market. Raising prices in such competitive environment is generally not feasible. On the other hand, when conditions allow, firms might increase prices and profits. Incumbent benefit from cost advantage by adopting best practice in production, delivery, and management, which lowers the threat of new entrants. Firms with larger production capacities can leverage economies of scale further protecting their market position. Additionally, brand loyalty built over time make it even harder for potential competitor to enter the market. So here is the characteristic of potential competitors. This threat is high when industry barrier to entry is low. Established firms hold their position and discourage firm from entering their market through price and margin reductions. This threat is low when firms have established best practice in marketing management, production, and administration. High brand loyalty enables firms to mitigate this risk. So competitiveness among industry incumbents. So this are the rivalry among industry incumbents is fears in a market that has many players that are dealing with slowing growth rates. It is also a result of demand-related factors that leads firms to compete to capture a higher market share. Firms compete more fiercely when demand is high and many companies vie for market share. However, if demand is strong and only a few firms are in the market, competition tends to lessen, allowing firms to avoid aggressive rivalry and focused on maximizing profitability. Industry structure and life cycle affect this dynamic. In mature markets with slow growth and consolidation, firms avoid direct competition to preserve profitability. Established players often benefit from brand loyalty and efficient practice, reducing the needs for fierce competition. In contrast, Interised competition arises in market with price wars and aggressive marketing campaign. In growing markets, firms use strategies like franchising and management contracts to quickly establish market share. For example, Hilton and Holiday Inn use these approaches to expand rapidly after World War II rather than relying solely on owning and operating their own properties. Industry structure changes with the market life cycle. In a growing market, firms enter and create a fragmented structure. As the market mature and consolidate larger firms, they over smaller ones, leading to an oligopolistic structure. For example, the U.S. upscale hotel market is mature with established major change, while China's upscale hotel market is still growing with many players establishing their brand and using growth strategies. So here's are the characteristics of competitiveness among industry incumbents. So first, this threat is high when the industry growth rate has slowed down. Second, it is low if the environment is liberal, seen especially in growing markets. Third, Firms avoid direct competition in mature market. Buyer's influence. It is a threat when consumers can put pressure on firms in terms of buying power and influence on the firm's well-being. It is also comes in the forms of price, discounts, and demands for better quality and levels of service, especially after sales service. Buyers can also influence the firms when they might choose to switch to other products and service.
especially if switching means lower costs. This is often seen in the hotel and restaurant products market, especially in mid-price to the lower end of the market. When buyer groups form a significant portion of the market, their influence on firms could be high, thereby increasing their power. The opposite is true when firms are able to influence market when buyer groups are small. Firms can influence buyer groups by charging higher price and even providing minimum service at moderate quality service. So here's are the characteristics of buyer influence. First, a threat when buyers' buying power and influence on the firm are high. Second, Buyer's influence comes in the form of price discounts, demand for better quality and level of service, especially after sale service. Third, buyers could switch to other products and service quite easily when switching costs are low. Supplier influence. Suppliers have more influence on firms when they can charge higher prices for raw materials and finished goods. This happens when few suppliers can provide customized goods with access to raw materials, technologies, and other relevant resources that are unique and have potential for value generation. When suppliers are able to control the quality and price of raw materials based on their power and incumbents, firms have no choice but to accept or switch suppliers. But in a market where suppliers have the power, Finding a supplier who is able to meet the needs of the firm may be difficult. In the hospitality and tourism business context, supplier influence is seen in the case of raw materials supplied to restaurant businesses, especially in emerging markets where quality could be an issue. Many upscale restaurants face challenges when they cannot meet the standard because of the inferior quality of raw material. So here are the characteristics of supplier influence. First, the threat from suppliers is high when they can charge higher price for raw materials and finished goods. Second, threat arises when few suppliers can provide customized goods with access to the unique raw materials, technology, and other relevant resources. Third, Threat is high when suppliers can control the quality and the price of raw materials. Fourth, when the supplier has higher influence, incumbent firms have no choice but to accept or switch suppliers, which is difficult when only a few suppliers exist. Substitute products. This pertains to industries and markets where alternative products could replace existing products based on fluctuating demand related to FUDs, trends, and market buying behavior. Substitute products are considered when markets are exposed to threats. For example, sales of chicken were up when mad cow disease was at its height. Similarly, chicken products were consumed less when bird flu emerged during winter months of 2006 to 2007 in regions where there was more exposure to disease. The price of products can go up significantly due to the increased demand as seen in the case of chicken and pork products when mad cow disease was rampant. So here are the characteristics of substitute products. First, pads trends, and consumer buying behavior influence market to pursue alternative products. Second, substitute products are considered when markets are exposed to threats. So for better understanding, let's watch the video on the next slide. Most people think of business competition as a tug of war between rivals, with each competing for more sales or market share. But according to Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter, Competition is more complex than that. It's not about who's the biggest. It's about who is the most profitable. And profitability is defined by five competitive forces. Let's start with your buyers or customers who would always be happier to pay less and get more. In the airline industry, price competition is fierce because so many travelers just want the cheapest flight. Then, there are your suppliers, who'd ideally like to be paid more and deliver less. 
Powerful suppliers will use their clout to raise prices or insist on other more favorable terms. A third source of competition comes from substitute products or services that meet the same basic need you do. These aren't always obvious rivals. The toughest competitors may come from different industries. New entrants can also create tension. For instance, Southwest Airlines challenged the industry by flying just one kind of airplane, reducing costs and allowing it to offer better ticket deals. This pushed other carriers to spend more to retain their customers. Finally, you still have to fight your existing rivals, and intense competition reduces everyone's profitability. The major airlines have been in this position for years, forcing them to defend increasingly narrow profit margins, with fees for exit row upgrades, checked bags, even snacks. These five forces define every industry structure and shape your company's future. Once you understand them, you can make better predictions, create more competitive strategies, and increase your profits. The dynamics of competition and strategic groups. So what is dynamic competition? So these are the ongoing changes and interaction between companies within the market as they strive to gain a competitive edge. This dynamic are influenced by various factors such as market condition, technological advancement, customer preference, and regulatory changes. As companies compete, they constantly adjust their strategies, pricing products, offering and market effort in response to rivals' action and market ships. While the strategic groups are the cluster of firms within an industry that have a similar business models, strategies are competitive approaches. So it is a companies within the same strategic group typically compete more directly with each other than with firms outside their group. These groups are identified based on a key strategic dimensions, such as pricing, quality, product range, distribution channels, or target markets. Competing firms engage in a rivalrous action in markets where customers have higher bargaining power. As firms compete among themselves for market share, they develop similarities and difference in terms of strategic posture and market orientation. Essentially, these firms that are similar in terms of strategy could be grouped based on certain firm's characteristics. Firms that are part of a given strategic group are almost the same in terms of products and services, competing directly against each other. This firm products and service are close substitute for one another, often part of the options that customers choose among during transactions. Since the competition among firms in a given group is direct, firms often fight for a position in these groups, including access to resources and supplier buyer contacts. It should be noted that the similarities among firms in a given strategic group leads to different across group, as the firms in each group have different traits and behaviors. Firms need to consider their position and group based on which companies they want to compete against based on their strategic orientation in those markets. For instance, in the hospitality industry, hotels like Marriott and Hilton offer similar products in global market based on their positioning strategy. These hotels that are part of strategic group have similar firm characteristics, including target markets, product service bundles, core competencies, and the type of contractual arrangement used as vehicle of growth and global markets. In fact, Hyatt Hotel belong to this group in terms of characteristic traits. Another example of strategic group is fast food restaurant firms like McDonald's, and Burger King that offer similar products and service in global markets. They have similar positioning strategies, products and service, and competencies required to succeed in their product markets. Based on the characteristic of firms in terms of the markets, they serve and the products and services they offer. A clear segmentation of the product market comes about. 
In this segment, strategic groups emerge based on the positioning strategies of firms. For instance, in the hotel industry, the market segment include luxury, upscale, mid-market, economy, and budget hotel market segments. In this segment, hotels offer distinct products and services for unique market, which gives rise to strategic group as firm by a four position and competitive setting. Environmental scanning in the hospitality and tourism firm. It is the process by which a company systematically monitors and analyzes external factors that could impact its operation, strategies, and overall success. It is also involves gathering information about trends, events, and changes in the external environment, including economic, political, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors often referred to as festal analysis. The goal of environmental scanning is to identify opportunities and threats in external environment and adjust business strategy accordingly. So here are the different sectors. First is adapting to market trends. The hospitality and tourism industry is sensitive to changes and consumers' preference, such as shifts in travel trends, preference for sustainable tourism, or the growing popularity of digital booking platforms. Environmental scanning helps firms stay ahead of these trends and adopt their offerings accordingly. Second is the regulatory compliance. Tourism and hospitality firms must comply with a wide range of regular regulations from health and safety standards to environmental law. Regularly scanning the legal environment ensures that companies remain compliant and avoid penalties or operational disruptions. Economic factors. Economic conditions such as exchange rates, inflation, and disposable income levels directly impact tourism demand. Environmental scanning helps firms anticipate economic shifts and adjust pricing, marketing, and operational strategies to maintain profitability. Technological advancement. The hospitality and tourism industry is rapidly evolving due to technological advancement, such as online booking system, mobile apps, AI-driven customer service. By monitoring technological trends, firm can adapt new technologies to enhance guest experience and streamline operations. Competitive analysis. Environmental scanning allows firm to keep an eye on competitors, understand their strategies, and ad- and identify potential threats or opportunities in the market. This information is vital for maintaining a competitive edge. Sustainability and environmental concerns. As consumers become more environmentally conscious, there is growing demand for sustainable tourism practice. Scanning environmental factors helps firm adopt eco-friendly practice and appeal to this market segment. Social and cultural shifts. Changes in demographics, cultural trends, and social values can significantly impact the types of service and experience that travel six. Environmental scanning helps firms tailor their offerings to meet the evolving needs to their customers. From a historic perspective, environmental scanning was seen as the top management responsibility with these managers acting as boundary spanners who gather and share information for decision-making. While this approach works in stable environments, today Global's market demands that managers at all levels engage in scanning due to increased uncertainty. The type of information needed varies by management level, making it essential for all employees including frontline staff, to the information, seekers or boundary spanners to identify trends and guide value creation. This view is also supported by hospitality researchers like Acomust. Many firms recognize the importance of scanning but often don't formalize it. 
especially in hospitality and tourism. Manager typically used two approaches. The first one is the outside-to-in approach, which involves scanning for macro trends, and the inside-to-outside approach, which focus on specific information to address internal needs. Scanning method includes individualistic approach where managers gather information independently and collective approaches evolving managers across the organization hierarchy. The frequency of scanning varies depending on the job level and task nature. For roles like sales and marketing managers, scanning occurs more frequently than in operational roles like front desk managers. Information technology has simplified and increased the frequency of scanning. Managers at all levels strategic, tactical, and operational use computer system to assist in scanning the business environment. The scanning process involves identifying trends that can possibly or negatively impact the firm. However, managers may be influenced by their own preference and biases often focusing more on positive information, which can lead to strategic MIPIA. This selective focus can trap the firm and challenges from its external environment. Therefore, managers' perceptions are crucial in scanning process. To avoid personal biases, Managers should incorporate both objective and subjective information in their environmental analysis. When information is scarce, managers should use proxies that closely substitute the unavailable data. Often managers turn to consulting firms for such information. However, it is crucial to carefully scrutinize any data before using it in impact analysis. The more data sources available, the more comprehensive and accurate the analysis becomes. As multiple sources help, verify the information reliability. The external environment and the international perspective. Global market liberalization in emerging economies has the regulated key sectors, creating economic interdependence between developed and developing nations. Capital and goods flow, both waste and technological advancement, drive a knowledge-based economy, prompting firms to enhance core competencies through strategic knowledge management. The transnational economy and demand for specialized labor have driven labor migration from developing to developed economies. While firms expanding internationally have brought managerial expertise in the opposite direction, this has created interdependencies among economies, ushering in an area of global firms and market. Advanced technology has further enabled firms to establish networks that enhance information flow across borders. However, globalization has increased firms' risk exposure as they stretch resources for growth. The downsides of globalization and increased risk were evident during the recent financial crisis, prompting firms to seek government assistance for survival. The global hospitality and tourism industry includes diverse firms like hotels, restaurants, and airlines that operate internationally. By pursuing an international strategy, these firms can balance business cycles across different regions. For example, Marriott offsets seasonal downturns by operating in both hemispheres. However, internationalization increased risk, which can be managed through methods like franchising, management contracts, and ownerships.